So the first speaker is Joe Fabrizio, um, a senior researcher at the University of Oxford. <laughs> um, and the talk my talk today is uh, The Elephant Queen, Can a Nature Documentary Mitigate Human-Elephant Conflict? So, lots of talk about elephants. I don't think I need to introduce that to anyone at this point. Um, lots of interventions historically have focused on separating elephants and people, but um, increasingly we, we're thinking about ways of communicating um, about this, this interaction and how to increase levels of tolerance using different types of media. And one type of media that often comes to, to, uh, to the fore are visual media like, for example, documentaries. Yet, and I you know, really want to emphasize this point, Often we make a lot of assumptions about what, just because something is beautiful, just because it is even a little bit, you know, uh, 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 it makes us a little bit emotional about a topic, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get us and deliver the, the change that we want to see. Right? And so it is really important that if you want to make great claims about something, then we present great evidence to back that up. There is an animal in Africa that truly reflects our sense of family. Meet Mimi, the newborn. Weiwei, the toddler. And Athena, who looks after them all. Their entire world is built on the love and strength of their family. Home is a waterhole in paradise. One day, it all changes. Experience the incredible story of an inspirational leader. The loved ones she must protect, the home they must leave, the journey they must take. point, um, what 99% of the talks were to do is we'd say, great, amazing, impactful movie, beautiful aesthetics, right, great narrative, surely everyone who sees this obviously loves elephants forever and ever. You know, the end, and we can all go home. But in this case, we were fortunate enough that um, you know, Save the Elephants um, put in the effort um, to really go about collecting some evidence to understand what was the impact of watching a documentary like this um, in the context of those people that live, actually live with the animals. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you today about. So there was this mobile cinema that was implemented. It was from 2021 to the end of June 2022. Um, southeastern Kenya, again around in, in particular places where elephants were known to have, be an issue, right? people would live directly with the animals, uh, focused again on rural, rural communities with levels of high levels of conflict. And um, the survey, or the data that's collected here, is large and survey-based, and it's based on the hazard acceptance model, which I'll talk about in just one second. So this is the model. Um, it was originally developed uh, for conflict with carnivores. In this case, we adapted it for um, the case of elephants. Uh, we, we felt that it was reflective of a series of, sort of realities and constructs that we felt were, were important, right? and that's why we, we focused on it. We also felt it was important to choose a behavioral model that was more sort of strictly adapted to the context and issue, right? in this case, conflict. Right? Um, and that's why we decided to use that. Now, in terms of experimental design, and, and I'll, I'll be the first to say that because of time constraints, I, 
I won't go into the full sort of level of detail, but I'm really happy to answer any questions anyone might have at the end or uh, at the very end of the session even. So we were really key, we we're really keen to make sure that we were able to make cause effect statements, right? And that meant needing some sort of counterfactual, in this case is a formal control group. Um, data was set up as pre-post follow-up, so there was data collection at three periods of, in, in time, and the follow-up was 90 days after the viewing, and it was done via the phone. The other ones were doing what were done in person, the pre and the post. <coughs> uh, in terms of sampling, we focused on quarter sampling. Um, it was pretty difficult to do sample, sampling randomly, and particularly because in each community we didn't have an enormous number of people. We felt it was just better to try to cover, make sure we covered key demographics rather than um, go on a limb, bet our, uh, our money on random sampling, which then could give us something balanced or not. Um, of course, it is not really feasible to randomize who goes to see an event uh, you know, in a community. And so because of that, we had a quasi-experimental approach, which, by which I mean that we had we tried to compare people in the control and the, our treatment, so to speak, our documentary, say, uh, group, um, that were similar. Right? And when I say similar, I don't mean similar in every way. Of course, they're not like twins right? uh, in each. Um, I'm talking just a similar you know, sort of key characteristics, which, again, I'm happy to elaborate further if anyone's interested. Um, of course, one of the challenges, I'm not sure how many uh, of you have used sort of matching algorithms, um, but one, one sort of key challenge when, challenge when using them is that there's really a thousand ways to cut the cake. Um, you can use a variety of different algorithms. Within each algorithm, the way you set it up can really also vary enormously. Um, and so what ends up happening is there are some relatively arbitrary decisions that end up being made that often can have serious impact on your conclusion, right? Um, and so because of that, we decided that the best way to do this was to basically not rely on a single way of matching respondents into two groups, but instead just do, not all because that would not be feasible, but a very large number of specifications, in this case 300 plus ways of matching respondents, um, and so that um, we could really test how sensitive our conclusions were to the specific method that we were choosing, right? And in terms of analyses, we pre-registered, so no, we, we you know, very cognizant, this, yeah, two seats over there, and we're very cognizant of the fact that, you know, everyone wants to succeed. And so we were in a situation where, you know, of course we have all, all the you know, we are also you know, people as well, right? So we have all the uh, incentive to try to, uh, you know, unconsciously speaking, right? To, to, to sometimes sort of pull things a little bit our way, right? And so we pre-registered this research, which <laughs> meant that before doing any data analyses, our methods were published online in a publicly accessible website so that we couldn't sort of slightly just tweak things a little bit, you know, in our favor later on, um, just because, you know, for example, if things didn't go exactly as we, as we hoped, right? And so that is to sort of keep us honest, right? Because yeah, we're people too. So this is the type of output that we're getting. So let me explain it to you, just uh, give, give me a second. It's a little overwhelming, you know, I, I apologize in advance. So basically what we're seeing here is each of these lines here is one potential way we could have matched the control and treatment group. Um, and by the way, actually, let me, let me, let me go actually go back a couple of slides just to tell you that what I'm going to show you is uh, results. So we measured each of these constructs, right? We measured each of these constructs and we compared and see if there was change, right? Um, and the results I'm going to show you are for some of them, again, just because of time constraints. Um, but again, I'm happy to respond and, and any questions you have about how that is. So what you're seeing here, for example, right, is one of the constructs of the model is faith in authorities, in essence, faith in the management authority. Um, and what you're seeing here at the zero is no effect, right? And each of these lines there is one potential way we could have matched our control in our treatment. Right? As you can see, there's lots of potential different ways, and they tell you quite different stories, right? And that's the reason why we felt it was so important to not just pick one, because it would, would be easy to pick the one that favored us, right? We could have just done this analysis and said, hey, actually, you know, 
this one over there, or this one over the top, that's the one that's the best one. And just retrospectively came up with you know, rationalized why that was the case, right? Um, and so we felt strongly that you know, it was important to show. And what we get from this, what we get from this is that the vast majority of these indicators cross zero, which tells us that we didn't see a change in this particular indicator. Right? Now, moving on to the next one. <coughs> so, what we, overall, what did we see? We saw, unsurprisingly, changes in knowledge immediately after. No surprises there. But what was pretty surprising was that when we come back 19 years later, we, that change was not longer there. And that was quite a, was a, bit, a bit strange. So if people forget that fast. 90 days is not that long. And actually, when we looked into the data, what happened, which I thought was really interesting, was that the control group just leveled up with a, with a documentary group. Basically, which we think just means that people talk to each other, right? So people go and watch this thing, and they go, "Oh, we just watch this, you know, documentaries about this one story, and this happens and that happens, and there was this also this other thing." And so basically, you know, that 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 knowledge transfers across and levels up, and that's why when you go back 90 days after, um, you don't actually see any difference anymore. Now, in terms of affect, this is the one result we are still trying to figure out. Because um, we didn't see uh, any, uh, a change immediately, but we did see it later on. And we're not quite sure why that is. We also collected, one thing I didn't mention was that we collected, also did interviews. And in each community we collected two to three interviews with local leaders to get a sense of what their perception was of how the movie was received in different communities. And so we're now going through that qualitative data to get a little bit of a more sense of like why this could have been and, and you know, explain a little bit the mechanism by which you know, this, this result came about. So, as I told you, this is the example that I showed you. We didn't change in terms of uh, um, relationship with the management authorities, no change there. There was an important uh, change in the short term in terms of benefits, um, but that, was, that dissipated itself in the 90 days. Um, in terms of control, not so much. And in terms of cost, yes, as in like perceived costs went down in the short term, but that change sort of again dissipated itself three months later, right? And so, really, what I, I, I sort of want to, you to take home from, from, from this presentation um, is really that there's a world of impact to be measured beyond knowledge. Um, you saw there that really varies with different indicators. It's relatively straightforward to get people to learn information, but then translating that into something much more meaningful, much closer to the types of things we want to see in the world, and that will impact how wildlife is managed, how people relate and behave towards wildlife, as two, that are two separate things. Um, in terms of time, does erode quite a lot of our, of our you know, short-term gains, right? And what I think this means, which is we're going to, it's going to be another challenge is that if you do just one shot approaches, you're likely to not, it's likely not to stick. So we're going to have to do this repeat exposures, right? Which again, I, we can't really say that's a surprise, right? We know from advertising, for example, that's really the case that, you know, if you just expose one person once to a particular message, it's unlikely to stick, right? But of course, that, that challenge gained an enormous dimension when we're talking about communities that in order to reach them repeatedly, there's a whole logistics that has to be put into place, right? So there's that challenge to bear in mind. Um, and yeah, I thought, I, I think, you know, there's some pretty promising results here. Now, I think I have to, I have to bear in mind that this documentary, it, it, you know, wasn't really designed for that particular target audience, right? So to be honest, that we got those changes in the short term, personally, it's quite surprising. Um, and so if it, was, if it was something that was more targeted for that particular audience, that had some repeated uh, exposure, I could really see how we could deliver some, you know, pretty interesting sort of benefits, um, potentially. But of course, you know, uh, that's my you know, mandatory sort of you know, thing. More research is needed, obviously, because then I would be out of a job. So then there's that. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I welcome questions. Do we have time? We have. Fifteen. Okay, cool. One question, quick. All right. Oh no. 
Let's go. Let's do two questions. We'll do very quickly. Come on. Can, can Mine's it. a very quick one. Ah, I'm just you. wondering, is there any data from advertising that says how many times you have to expose things for them to kind of yeah. sink in? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. So there's, a, there's, this, um, there's, this, there's this rule that is, I think, based on pretty limited data um, that says seven times. But to be honest, I also see now data from social media now, because of course we have a lot more data nowadays, and it, it really really varies for, from, from topic to topic, audience to audience, which is really an unhelpful answer, I realize. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we probably need to work out in our own context how long that's going to... We need our own metrics for our own context, I think, probably, sadly. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your, your talk. It should be a, a standard that any local community should see first what has been taken in their environment. And I'm afraid many of these corporations that do documentaries around the world and make a lot of money, they never bother to show it to the local people. So congratulations for that.